Hey friends, it's Rena Olson with the Relevate Podcast, here with another episode to inspire and enlighten you. Today's topic is a tough one. It's Alzheimer's disease and brain health. So it's a topic near and dear to my heart as I lost both my mother, my mother-in-law, and my older sister to the disease. So no doubt it's a devastating diagnosis, but there is so much in our power to protect our own brains and to love those better who struggle with the disease. Lisa Skinner is here to talk us through it. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Well, Lisa Skinner, welcome to the Relevate Podcast. Well, thank you, Rena. Thank you so much for having me on as your guest. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, yeah. So we are going to do uh, dive deep into a topic that is uh, definitely near and dear to my heart. Alzheimer's and dementia has really uh, hit my family uh, severely and personally, and I just don't think we're talking enough about it and that we don't understand it enough, and we're not really supporting those who have it in the best way possible. So I love the fact that our paths have crossed and that's really kind of your life's work and your your passion is to help families and those with Alzheimer's just um, through better communication and kind of better understanding of a disease that is just so, so baffling to so many. Uh, You couldn't have said it better. And one of the things that I have discovered, I've been doing this for over 25 years, is probably um, the biggest obstacle that people have is in not understanding the disease. Sure. And it creates all kinds of obstacles for everybody, for caregivers, for family members. I've seen it divide families. Mm -hmm. I've seen it... um, just pit people against one another. And I feel in the 25 years that I've been counseling families and I've written a best-selling book on the subject, and I've also had eight of my own family members afflicted with the disease, three blood relatives, I mean, excuse me, five were blood relatives and three married into the family. Um, the, the, the common denominator, I think, with just about everybody I've encountered in my life is their lack of understanding of what is happening to the brain. And a lot of these really kind of unique behaviors that surface as a, a result of the damage being done to the brain. And one of the things that I've stated in my book that I think is really important for people to understand, I kind of compare it to somebody who may have been able to hear all of their life and then all of a sudden have become hearing impaired. Well, you know, family members and friends and, and, and people who have had relationships with a person who all of a sudden can't hear, you, you don't wanna just stop communicating with that person. You're gonna find a different way to communicate with that person. The communication that you have with somebody who is in their mid to later stage of dementia is not going to be the same as it was uh, pre-illness, but you can find newer ways and better ways to communicate and still have a fulfilling relationship with that person. The other thing that I was influenced by is my grandmother was the first person in my family and my very first experience with somebody with dementia. And while I watched her go through that, it actually really broke my heart. She was suffering from it. Oh, this was back in the 70s. And even back then, they called it senile dementia. Your grandmother has gone mad. She's losing her mind in the head so they really thought it was like a mental illness which we know it's not a mental illness it's brain disease very very different and um the perception of it was was really heartbreaking my grandmother had was suffering from delusions and hallucinations she was calling the police on a regular basis they finally got a hold of my mother and said to her straight out you've got to do something with this woman. 
She said, that. and I was present when they said that. And it really hurt me. I knew she wasn't a nut. I'd known my grandmother very well. She lived a couple miles from me and I had a very close relationship with her. And then, you know, I saw these, these unbelievable changes in her personality and um, her cognitive function, but I knew she wasn't a nut. <laughs> and that was the perception. And the thing that's really interesting to me is now 40 plus years later, the perception is not all that different. And it really kind of falls back to what we discussed a few minutes ago, that it's due to people's lack of understanding of what's happening to the brain. And as the damage is being done, things are happening. And we all, I think we all understand that the person really changes dramatically. We lose, we lose the person that we originally knew, but they're still there. Yes. And it's really just a matter of being provided with tools to help you have better communication skills when you see the changes in their personality and their, um, the things that they're no longer able to remember or no longer able to relate to. So, um, so I got my degree in human behavior and wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with it. But I was very impacted by my grandmother's illness. So kind of that came into play. And then um, we had moved to upstate New York and I answered an ad in, in the newspaper. They were looking for uh, what they called a community counselor. And it was basically somebody to do the assessments for people to go into assisted living and memory care, assess their, their level of cognition and and that was my first introduction to um, that uh, world professionally. And I spent over 25 years in, um, in that industry. And I had my own business as a counselor and helped families place their loved ones in memory care wings and just, you know, um, helped them understand the day-to-day -day challenges that we face um, with this disease. And the one thing that I'm sure you're very well aware of, Rena, is it's a very long illness. The average person can have it for anywhere from eight to 15 years. My grandmother was a 20 year wow. sufferer. Doctors typically don't diagnose um, Alzheimer's disease or any of the of the brain diseases that cause dementia until the uh, person is already in the mid stage, yeah. because the symptoms are so subtle mm -hmm. that it's hard to really um, determine whether or not the behaviors that are being displayed, the symptoms that are being displayed, are just normal part of the normal aging process. A little bit of forgetfulness, or if there's something more serious going on. And then when it has progressed to about the mid stage, the difference between the normal aging process and brain disease becomes very blatantly apparent. Yeah, and it's, it's such hard news for the family to get that diagnosis or that suspected di diagnosis. And a lot, a lot of times you're observing and wondering or fearing that that's what's happening, you know, that can go on for years before, um, before you ever really, you ever really know. And then, you know, I've heard that you, for Alzheimer's, that autopsy is really the only definitive diagnosis for that. Is that still kind of the clinical thought on that? It is still true. Yes. So with Alzheimer's disease, plaques and tangles form in the brain. But there's no diagnostic imaging right now that can definitively um, uh, diagnose that. So you are right, still to this day, the only true uh, diagnostic tool they have for Alzheimer's disease is upon autopsy. So really what the clinicians have to do is eliminate the other things that could be causing those similar symptoms 
And basically, I mean, there are some like mini mental exams and tests that doctors put people through, but it's, it's really a process of elimination. And the other thing too is mixed dementia is not uncommon. So you can have Alzheimer's disease going on in your brain, but you can also have other types of brain disease concurrently at the same time that are causing the symptoms of dementia. So that's, that's not uncommon at all is to have what we call mixed dementia. You have a couple different types of brain disease causing the brain damage. Mm. So, and I believe in our earlier conversation, you said there's over 100 types of brain diseases that kind of fall within that dementia category. Am I, am I stating that correctly? Yes. I couldn't even begin to tell you all of them. The most popular, the mo the best known one, the one that we are most um, commonly aware of is Alzheimer's disease. It's the number one cause of dementia. Vascular dementia is in second. It is uh, caused by little strokes. And um, then there's Parkinson's disease. You can have Parkinson's disease with dementia or without dementia. I've seen it both ways. There's Huntington's disease. There's Lewy body disease. That kind of became well known um, when Robin Williams was diagnosed with that. What dementia really is, is relating to is the variety of symptoms that are displayed when somebody has one of the brain diseases that causes all these symptoms. Not everybody with Alzheimer's disease displays the same symptoms. They range um, drastically between people. The hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is the loss of your short-term memory, your cognitive function, your ability to judge and to reason. But then there's the extreme person like my grandmother who has, you know, who thought birds were living in her mattress and rats were running um, along the, the walls of her home. She actually believed she saw them. She wouldn't take a shower because she was scared to death that somebody was going to kill her while she was taking a shower. So she suffered from really extreme symptoms. And this is all put into the bucket of what we call dementia. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. It, sh it sure does. And, you know, and talking about the, the various types of symptoms that can vary from day to day and from hour to hour as well. I know my mom, there were times where I would call her and she would be so lucid. It would just, it would just be um, hopeful, but heartbreaking at the same time. You know, it is not a linear progressive type of disease at all. No. And there are stages, what we call stages of the progression, because it is a degenerative disease. In other words, it won't get better. It gets worse and it's progressive. And everybody, again, is different. Knowledge, there's power. So I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Lisa, can you help us understand, maybe give us some tips for people who are loving somebody with one of these brain diseases, how we can, how we can better love and be a caregiver to people who are in a situation like that? Absolutely. By understanding what's happening to the brain will help better uh, people better understand um, where these behaviors are coming from. So, so one of the things that I have found helps people understand what's happening to the brain during the progression of this disease is I like to use what I call the light bulb analogy. Mm -hmm. Think of, now this is really um, more pertains more to Alzheimer's disease than some of the other brain diseases because they the, um, the disease that's doing the damage to the brain differs depending on what type of brain disease. But we'll talk about Alzheimer's because it is the most common form of brain disease that causes dementia. And what's happening to the brain um, during dementia is it attacks the short-term memory mm -hmm. first. 
To turn a light on, you flip a switch up. To turn a light off, you flip a switch down. So during the progression of the disease, while the short-term memory is being damaged and attacked, the short-term memory is on more than it's off in the beginning and middle stages of the disease. As the disease does more damage to the short-term memory, um, and, and as the disease progresses, the short-term memory then gets flipped off more than it's on, and eventually it's off for good. So people then pull from their long-term memory because our long-term memory stays intact for the entire disease. So when it's off, the person is pulling from their long-term memory. When it's on, their short-term memory is exactly like ours and we're thinking in the here and now. This is what causes a lot of these strange behaviors that we see with dementia. Um, one of the common behaviors is somebody will think that somebody that has passed on is still alive. My mother-in-law, five years after her husband died, all of a sudden jumped off, jumped up from the sofa and thought she had to rush home because her deceased husband was waiting for her at home. Well, at that very moment, that short-term memory switch got flipped off. She was living in a past time. And in that past time that became her reality for that moment was when her husband was still alive. So she absolutely insisted that I take her home because Marty was home waiting for her to fix dinner. And she was all nervous and she was completely fixated on, on this reality that she believed was true that he was waiting for her at home. So um, to give you an example of how I diffused that, I said to her, oh no, Marianne, it's okay. He just called and he knows you're over here and you're having a really nice visit with me and your son. And he said, oh, just stay as long as you want and I'll see you when you get home. And she said, oh, he did? And he knows I'm here? Oh, absolutely. She sat down, became relaxed again, and it completely diffused the entire situation. What I had to do in that instance was not correct her and say, oh, Marianne, don't you remember? Marty's been gone for five years. That could have, that could have caused her to react like she was hearing it for the first time and going, gone into an absolute panic. Nice. What I did instead was I joined her reality because I recognized that what I call that short-term memory light switch being flipped off happened. That's the only explanation why she would think her husband who had been deceased for five years was waiting for her at home. And because I do this professionally, I knew how to re react to it. I knew how to respond to that. Nice. This is the biggest challenge that we face as family members and caregivers and friends and relatives of people with short term with Alzheimer's disease and the short term memory loss is listening for the cues mm -hmm. that tell us that they have now gone to a different reality than ours because that short-term memory switch got flipped off. That's, that's hard for some people because you were not being truthful with your loved one, but it is necessary, right? It's yeah, and that's great probably- to learn how to, um, you know, just, and I think like you said, how to diffuse the situation. Actually referred to as joining the other person's reality. And one of the reasons why there's such a differentiation between the two is because no matter, once that, that short-term memory switch gets flipped off, regardless if it's for five seconds, five minutes, five hours, or five years, that person, because they are pulling from their long-term memory, 
it doesn't matter what you say to them or to how hard you try to convince them or correct them or bring them back into our reality, it's not going to work. They are living in the past for however long that's going to be. So we have found that if you join their reality, that you're going to have a much easier time of communicating with that person and diffusing all kinds of um, stressful situations and scenes and outbursts and panic because um, you're helping them understand the what the reality that they're living in. You, even though you know it's not the truth, it's the truth to them. Mm, exactly. And I, I've heard you say that to be a caregiver, you need to learn to be a detective. How do you how do you begin to develop those skills if you're lo loving somebody with brain disease? Well, I think the first thing is to understand this short-term memory short circuit right. and listen for the cues and understand that when that short-term memory switch gets flipped off, they are now living in a reality from some time in their past. You don't know what that past time frame is. You have to figure it out by the things they're telling you. In a previous conversation, you were telling me that a lot of patients will say, I want to go home. Let's talk a little bit about that because that might not be as literal as we think it is. No, and it's a very common statement that they make. As a matter of fact, the last of my eight relatives who have uh, Alzheimer's disease is my mother's youngest sister. She's in a memory care facility. And that's one of the things that my uncle said. She keeps saying she wants to go home. She keeps saying she wants to go home. Which is heartbreaking to hear. Now, to him, he thinks he wants her to take her to their house. Right. But saying I want to go home can mean something completely different to each individual who's saying it. And it all depends on where they are in their long-term memory. I have seen uh, people with, in the late stages of dementia, who basically their short-term memory is completely shut off. They are living somewhere in their long-term memory. And some people end up being back in their childhood. So to them, going home means they want to go back to their parents' house because they're looking for security and comfort and familiarity. I've had um, other people who have said, I want to go home, and it was their their um, the house that they lived in with their husband when they first got married. Some people, I want to go home means they, they're ready to go to God. They're ready to leave the, the world. And that has that's the meaning to them. I want to go home. So it's different for everybody. And again, here you have to put your Sherlock Holmes hat on because you have to listen for the cues by asking questions. Tell me about your home. You don't want to further upset that person. And, you know, with a, um, a healthy brain, sometimes that level of questioning, you know, might be upsetting, but, you know, you just have to, to understand, you know, what you're dealing with at the time and, and respond accordingly. And I think, you know, that engagement has got to be healthy for them. Absolutely you know, it is. So and that they're, they're thinking, you know, you're asking meaningful questions to them. So they're, you know, they're actually having a chance to think through some, some various scenarios. No matter yeah, my advice is keep the questions open-ended and keep them simple, not complicated or detailed. So say, well, tell me about the house that you want to go to and let them talk. Definitely. And I would think resist the urge to correct is absolutely really important for caregivers to remember. That is key. So is okay. music a good therapy for a lot of people who are struggling with brain disease? 
music has been found to be one of the best um, tools available to us to help um, kind of stimulate memories in people's brains. People with brain disease, especially as they progress and, and their short-term memory is getting shorter and shorter and worse and worse, and they're pulling from these long-term memories, music um, helps stimulate memories and gives them a really good feeling. So as many feelings that we can create for them of joy and happiness and good feelings will stay with them for a much longer period of time than the actual experience. One story that is in my book is, is actually an example of somebody who just came alive hearing the song, Old Lang Syne. The man hadn't spoken in over a year and just really had regressed almost to an infantile state. And he was taken to a memory care um, facility and they had a, a guest musician there who was singing Old Lang Syne. And all of a sudden he just burst out singing the song. It, it triggered the memory that he had because he was a World War II veteran. And the man started talking after that where he hadn't spoken for over a year. So it was that song that just kind of brought him alive again because he related to it. So yeah, music is very therapeutic. And if you can play songs from their uh, generational era, that's even better because they'll recognize them and that'll stimulate memories for them of things that maybe they can relate to through those songs of their life. I love that. So let's talk a little bit about prevention and brain health and what we can do to, um, you know, to keep, to keep what we have and, and to live our, our life to the fullest. Do you have any tips for us on that, Lisa? Yes, there have been many, many studies that have shown that there are certain risk factors that will um, increase our chances of developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the more risk factors that relate to you, the more chance you have of developing disease. Now, this disease does not discriminate. Anybody can get it. So you have to take a look at the risk factors. The, the, there are risk factors that you can um, manage and kind of um, eliminate out of your life and lower then lower your risk. So the more risk factors that apply to you, the, the more risk you have of developing it. So here are the ones that um, we know are manageable. So the number one risk factor to developing Alzheimer's disease is age. And we can't do anything about that one. That's a given. That's a risk factor that every one of us has going against us. The yeah. second highest risk factor is cardiovascular disease, hypertension, heart disease. We can, we can, um, manage that through medications and through exercise and through diet. So that's something that we have control over. So if you can negate that as being a risk factor by being on medication, by doing exercise, by eating a, a proper healthy diet, then you're going to negate that risk factor and then you'll lower that risk um, of developing later on. Um, sleep apnea is a risk factor. People have sleep apnea. Um, that is a risk factor. Your weight is a risk factor. Um, your family history is a risk factor. Uh, your diet becomes a risk factor. So the more of these risk factors that apply to you personally, the more you have just increased your risk of developing dementia. And that's not to say you will, mm -hmm. but you've increased your chances of developing it. So of the risk factors that you can control and manage, 
the more you can uh, get under control will negate that from being a risk factor of developing Alzheimer's disease. So what about staying engaged in life? I mean, I feel that that's, uh, that's probably something we're not talking enough about. And, you know, I've, I've seen it happen again and again, where people retire, and they just sit at home and, you know, taking in way too much news and not getting enough exercise and not getting engagement with other people. Does that put a person at risk? Yes. Yes, there are many studies that have uh, kind of shown that um, you have to stay engaged and keep your brain stimulated. There's some interesting studies that actually um, re have revealed that the higher the education you achieved at a younger age lowers your risk. But just because you only graduated from high school and now you're 70 years old, you can still do things to help lower that risk. Learning a foreign language is probably one of the best things you can do. Learning a musical instrument, doing crossword puzzles, um, learning new information. And that reminds me, that's one of the um, sure signs that, the, that your cognitive dysfunction or, or impairment is not just part of normal aging. People with dementia can't retain new information. They can't learn new things and retain that information. It just goes out of their brain. So that's, that's another sign that you may have something more serious going on. If you're still capable of learning a musical instrument or, or reading a book and retaining that information or learning a foreign language or doing anything, crossword puzzles that'll, that'll keep your mind sharp and stimulated, then uh, your chances of developing Alzheimer's disease is actually reduced. Mm. You just got to keep on living. You've got to keep on living. Exercise is very important. It doesn't have to be, you know, hardcore, rigorous exercise. You can walk. Are there any resources available for caregivers in terms of groups on Facebook? Or, I mean, I think in a situation like, like this, it always helps to know that you're not alone uh, in, in dealing with a situation like that. Any, any tips for connecting in community with, with people who are going through a, sim a similar experience with loved ones? Uh, I have a book that explains a lot of it that's available on Amazon. I have a blog um, that I post a lot of these tips. But one of the things that people can do is um, join a support group. My um, father's twin um, brother suffered from Alzheimer's disease and he had a stranger in the mirror real life situation happen in, in their home. And my aunt had gone to a support group to help her understand the day-to-day -day challenges. And when she heard Harold talking to himself in the mirror, thinking that this was a new friend of his, didn't recognize himself in the mirror, she knew exactly what was going on. And she didn't, you know, go running in there and go, Harold, who are you talking to? That's you in that mirror. She <laughs> joined his reality and went along with it until I think she finally, the support group recommended that she either remove the mirror from the hallway or cover it up. And once she covered it up, that was it. The, the new friend must have gone away because the conversation ended. So support groups can be very, very helpful to people. And I think in one of the ways, even if they're, uh, they don't learn this type of information that we've been talking about today, they can hear other people sharing their stories and a lot of the stories that they'll hear other people tell them they'll be able to relate to, that this is all part of the disease. Exactly. So if people would like to get in touch with you or get a copy of that fantastic book, how, uh, how's the best way to get in touch, Lisa? Well, um, 
They actually can go on to my blog. I do post a lot of this information on a regular basis. And if people want to ask me questions, they're absolutely welcome to do that. And I will answer your questions. So to find the blog, you go on to Facebook, mm -hmm. um, go into search, and the name of the blog is the same title as the book, Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. So um, feel free to check out the blog. Hopefully there's a lot of helpful information um, for you to help you with these day-to-day -day challenges. And at any time, if anybody has a question that they'd like me to answer, I am more than happy to do so. Mm, well, thank you for doing that. One last question for you. So the word relevate means to uplift or restore to good spirits. I know this is, um, this is a tough conversation with not a a lot of hope to it, but I think, I think there definitely is, um, there is hope to be found here. Would you kind of close us out with a thought on that, Lisa? There definitely is hope to be found here because in, in understanding, in better understanding what's happening to your loved one and knowing and being um, equipped with a lot of these tools that we've talked about here today, you're not gonna be able to change the outcome of the disease or the progression of the disease. But again, it is such a long drawn out disease that what it will do is give you um, a much more enriched relationship with your loved one yes. than you otherwise would have had. And I can tell you, um, this is a fact. The number one reason why people don't go visit um, their relatives who have dementia is because they are so intimidated by it. They don't know how to act. They don't know what to say. And that you can change that just by enriching yourself with a lot of this information that we talked about today. And you can still have that great relationship with your grandma or your mother or your father. Um, and it doesn't have to be totally awkward and totally uncomfortable anymore. Yes, yes, yes. So what does love require of me? Sometimes it's, um, it's meeting that person halfway and putting on your detective hat and really, really meeting them with where they are. I think that is just such fantastic advice. I've enjoyed our conversation oh, so much too. and I love Love the work you're doing in this space and just helping people get smarter. And, um, you know, the, the, that person is still your loved one. So, um, and they always will be. Yes. Even though you may not recognize them um, the way you did before they got sick, they're still there and yeah. always will be. You just need let's to just a love different them. way to communicate with them. Right. And just let's just love them until they're not here anymore. I mean, yes. that, is, that is always, always the best solution. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation and learned a lot from Lisa Skinner, author of Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. It's, it's a tough conversation. It's a tough diagnosis. It's hard to find the hope in Alzheimer's disease. And when you just slowly watch your loved one fade away, but, there's hope in learning to love them better, to meet them where they are, to not correct them. Let's just keep them comfortable. Keep loving your person that they are still there. And that, uh, to me, that's the most important takeaway from this conversation. And also learning to protect our brain health by being active, by staying engaged, by learning new things. Work a puzzle learn a new language, learn to play an instrument. Just keep living, people. That is really so important. This is Rena Olson, and this is Relevate.